title of this program is um, called The Myths and Mysteries of Quabbin Reservoir and the Ware River Watershed. So the first myth, just a little joke, it often is that no one knows what the letters of the agency stand for. So DCR, DWSP, so that's our, um, the division we are. So Department of Conservation and Recreation, and we're the Division of Water Supply Protection. We manage the Quabbin, Wachusett, and Sudbury Reservoirs and the Ware River Watershed. Um, so our end of the responsibilities is the safe storage of the source waters, protection of the reservoir water quality and management of the watershed, so the land around the reservoirs. We work with another agency called the Massachusetts Water Resource Authority or the MWRA, um, and they are responsible for the drinking water distribution and treatment. Um, myth number two. Um, so Boston gets, you know, this water travels to Boston 65 miles, and that seems like a significant difference, um, but it is not our distance, but is not the farthest away. Um, Boston's not the only city that gets its drinking water from far away. And in fact, New York City, um, their drinking water supply comes from the Catskills, 125 miles away. And then San Francisco gets their drinking water from the Sierra Nevada. Um, and that's actually over 160 miles. Um, it travels from the starting reservoir to San Francisco. So that's a one a common myth we encounter um, at the visitor center. Um, one other common myth that the water only serves Boston. Um, the bulk of the water does travel to the greater Boston area. Um, and have we have a really nice map here that um, is from the MWRA, and it shows you the. Sorry, I closed out my arrow there. Um, so the water travels. It starts at Quabbin and travels through a series of aqueducts. Um, from Quabbin to Wachusett, from Wachusett it goes through an aqueduct to a treatment plant, from a treatment plant it bypasses the Sudbury reservoirs and then goes through these aqueducts to what we call high service reservoirs, which are big concrete tanks buried underground. Um, and from there the water goes to communities in the greater Boston area. So the bulk of the communities are in the greater Boston area, um, 48 of the 53 um, communities or actually 44 of the 53 communities are in the greater Boston area. Um, it does serve over 3 million people and 43% of the state. This is their drinking water. However, um, there are three communities that get their drinking water directly from Quabbin. They have their own aqueduct. It's called the Chicopee Valley Aqueduct and Wilbraham, Chicopee and part of South Hadley. So South Hadley Fire District number one. Um, they all get their water through the Chicopee Valley Aqueduct. They have their own treatment plant. It's right on Route 9. You may have driven by it many times. Um, and then they have high surface reservoirs or holding tanks in the town of Ludlow. Um, a really, really another common myth is that water is wasted all the way through the aqueducts and the water meters are broken. Um, that was true at one point. There was a lot of water waste um, at, in the system heading eastward. Um, however, through since about 1985, um, billions of dollars have been spent of water users money of ratepayers money to repair all the infrastructure update all the infrastructure. Um, and so the water waste is really pretty much at a minimum. And this chart actually comes from the MWRA and it shows you the average daily water use. So at one point in the 80s, um, it was actually over what they call the safe yield safe yield. So safe yield is the amount that's that red line. So that's the amount they want to stay at or under. Um, and you can see that it was 30 million gallons over what the safe yield was. But over the course of the last 30 years or so, 40 years, um, it has dropped until now. Um, daily water use is at, on average about um, 200 million gallons a day. So it did go up a little bit in 2022 because the city of Cambridge actually started getting water from our system, they actually usually have their own, but they had some issues with um, the chemicals called PFAS. And so they had to um, add new filtration to their own water system. So it did go up a little bit in 2022, but on average, it's about 20 million gallons a day. And so well below what's considered the safe yield. 
Um, so another thing we often encounter is the idea that the Quabbin Valley was the only area of Massachusetts that was cleared for a drinking water supply. So the, the metropolitan drinking water system was, um, you know, it, over the course of the 19th century was built going further and further west. So there actually are several communities that have were affected um, as Boston was looking for a water supply. Um, and this map is from 1916 to the date right there. And it shows um, the water supply that was there at the time, um, Lake Cotituit here in Framingham, had, um, and then the Sudbury Reservoirs, and then Wachusett Reservoir, and then eventually, and we'll get to that little bit of the story a little bit later on, Quabbin and Ware River. Um, but altogether, um, there were a lot of other towns. So the Sudbury Reservoirs and Constituent Reservoir were uh, affected the towns of Framingham, Marlboro, Southboro, Westboro, and Northboro. They all lost land to um, the Sudbury Reservoirs and then also the Lake Constituent, which was a reservoir at one point. And then the Wachusett Reservoir, which was built in the 1890s. So parts of Clinton, Boylston, and West Boylston were cleared um, to flood and create the Wachusett Reservoir. So there have been a lot of communities in Massachusetts that have given up land for a water supply for the greater Boston area. So just a modern picture of the Sudbury Reservoir, which currently is, there's only, there were one seven reservoirs on the Sudbury uh, River. Today, there's only like three active ones. The remaining four are actually uh, part of the state park system, the recreational areas. But here's a part of the Sudbury Reservoir. The three remaining ones are considered backup supply, so they're not daily usage, they're there for emergencies. And then the Wachusett Reservoir, Reservoir, which is an active water supply, um, and it holds, when it's full, 64 billion gallons of water. And they're both beautiful areas. Um, one other myth, too, going along with that whole thing is that the Swift River, which we call interchangeably the Quabbin Valley and the Swift River Valley, so same name for the uh, two names for the same area, and then the Ware River um, Valley, that they were the only areas really seriously considered to be cleared um, for another water supply. Um, in 1895, there was this report written by the Massachusetts Board of Health, and it was about the future of the metropolitan water supply system. And this map is from that report. And all of the areas colored are all the watersheds that they considered tapping into for Boston's water supply. Um, several of them were right around Boston or close, closer to Boston, the Merrimack River, the Charles River, um, the Shawshine River, the Ipswich River, a um, little bit further away down in the southeast part of the state. And I'm not even going to, I think, Assawampsit. I don't know how to really pronounce that one. Um, but they also looked at Lake Sebago in Maine and Lake Winnipesaukee in New Hampshire. So they were really casting around looking for um, a pl places to uh, get water supply for the um, growing city of Boston. Um, one thing, and it's kind of our fault at the visitor center, we spent a lot of time talking about the four towns that were taken completely removed, but they weren't the only towns that were affected. Um, the four towns that were completely removed were Enfield, Greena, Greenwich, Dana, and Prescott. Um, however, there were several other towns that were affected um, when they built the reservoir in the 1920s. Um, New Salem lost a big chunk called Millington. Uh, the town of Pelham lost a village. Shutesbury, Petersham, Ware, Belchertown, and Hardwick, Hardwick. They all lost land to the construction of the Quabbin Reservoir. So altogether, there were um, nine communities in the Swift River Valley. And then in a project that occurred at the same time, which was part of the greater water supply system project um, in the little bit, for, little bit further east in the Ware River, 23,000 acres of land was taken to protect the Ware River as a supplement to the Quabbin Reservoir. And that affected um, four towns, Barry, Ocam, Rutland, and Hubbardston. So Barry, Ocam, and Rutland all lost villages, White Valley and Barry, Coldbrook Springs and Ocam, and the West Rutland vi Village in Rutland. Um, Hubbardston lost land to the project. As far as I know, no complete village was taken. Um, and this one's a big one. It's one we, we talk about a lot, which is that people, um, it is, you know, this is state owned, managed, state managed land. Um, and a lot of people think that it is managed using general tax funding. So the Quabbin, the Ware River specifically. 
Um, however, all of the land that's managed by the Division of Water Supply Protection um, is, it's actually uh, paid for by the ratepayers. So as I say, the MWRA, they pay the MWRA, the Massachusetts Water Resource Authority. So the people who drink the water are the ones that entirely fund the DCR Office of Watershed Management's budget. So annually we get $30 million um, and that includes all the costs associated with um, land acquisition because we do occasionally purchase new land to protect more areas of the watershed. And probably one of the biggest things that we spend some of our money on from our budget, which is payments in lieu of taxes or pilot payments. And that's another big myth that people have, which is there are a lot of communities that have this um, state owned land in their towns. Um, and the idea that they do not receive any sort of compensation for that property. Um, they actually do. So there is, um, it's the DCR Watershed Pilot Program, and there's 21 communities altogether that have DCR uh, Division of Water Supply Protection property. Um, and in 1984, there was a, an act written when they created the MWRA and they modernized a lot of things and they created this um, payment in lieu of taxes program. And so all of these uh, 29 communities um, are paid annually by this program and it's done the same way that you know the department of revenue um, pays towns for any state-owned land and it's based on their formula which is they multiply um, the valuation of the land by the local commercial tax so it does vary very much by how much land a town owns or uh, how much land we own in a town and how much property is worth in that town um, if you're really curious about it we have a really good write-up on our website um, that explains the whole process, but I have a, a chart here that lists all of the towns and this this total pilot goes back to 1984. So it's um, for some of the towns, it's pretty significant. It goes from least to most. Um, and one thing about the program altogether is that it's almost $200 million have been um, distributed to communities since 1985. And it is a hold harmless payment, meaning that it can never be less than it was the year before. So say for instance, Rutland usually receives about $500,000 a year, a little bit more than that, but it will never be less than that. Um, and, and will probably continue to go up because land values in this part of the state, Central and, and Western Mass are increasing as well. Um, and this one's kind of interesting because I've actually heard some people who should know better, um, people who actually are employees of the state, um, saying that when the river is dry, the Ware River is dry, it's because in the summertime, it's because water's being sent to the reservoir and it's bad for the Ware River. So there's actually was legislation written as to when Ware River can be sent to the Quabbin Reservoir to supplement um, the level of Quabbin or to watch you sit. Um, so when you see the parts of the river look like they've run dry in the summer, um, it's actually because um, there is mitigation work trying to clean out invasive plants. So an invasive aquatic plant, I'm sure you're all familiar with the term, but it's a non-native plant that is, um, you know, uh, has nothing that, um, well, it's sort of overtaking the natural plants and, and they can be particularly harmful. Um, so in the Ware River, they noticed probably about 10, 15 years ago that they were having a problem with something called um, variegated milfoil. So they actually will drain sections of the rivers um, and remove it. They have to remove it by hand. A lot of aquatic invasives um, are really hard to get rid of and um, spraying um, herbicides is problematic. Um, so that is what they are doing. The MWRA actually does this program and that is what they're doing generally. They do it in the summertime. Um, and just because there is there is actual legislation that was written um, in the Ware River Act, which was passed in 1926, and that was for the creation of the Ware River watershed area, is that water can't be diverted from the Ware River on any day when the flow of the water is less than 85 million gallons. Um, so there has to be, you know, it has to, it's basically the flood waters of the Ware River. It also can only be done between um, May, the end of May and December, or sorry, it can't be done between the end of May and December, unless there is a special permission by the State Department of Public Health, which 
uh, rarely happens. So typically when we, when we transfer Ware River water, it is in late fall or winter. Um, oftentimes it seems to be in February. Um, and this is a myth that a lot of people like. Um, it has a lot to do with sort of our, um, the history we've created um, around um, the indigenous people who lived in Massachusetts. So in the area of Quabbin, it was the Nipmucks. Um, and there is a myth that the, the reservoir area is named for a chief, a Nipmuck chief called Nanny Quabbin. So my understanding is that is not accurate. Um, but the word Quabbin is um, a word that came from the Nipmucks and it was a description of the place and it's defined as place or meeting of many waters. Um, and one thing I, people are really fascinated, particularly by the towns that were removed and somehow they, they, they have this, you know, they're, so, they're really, really special. I um, mean, you know, they weren't, they were just little towns. They were a lot like all the towns that are still out there like Hardwick or um, Pelham. Um, these are just some pictures of life in the, both the Ware River and the um, Swift River Valley towns. However, they were different by virtue of where they were, just by virtue of their location. And this is a map from that 1895 report that was written by the Board of Health. Um, and so as early as 1895, um, the Ware River Valley and the Quabbin Valley had been identified as really prime locations where um, uh, drinking water supplies could be created for the metropolitan Boston area. Um, in 1895, they actually did propose building a small reservoir on the Ware River, as well as this very large reservoir on the Swift River. Um, I do want you to note if you have seen a map, a current map of the Quabbin Reservoir. So this was drawn by engineers in the 1895, in 1895, just how accurate that they were <laughs> in their um, in their uh, estimation of the areas that would flood if they dammed the river. Um, reading the report itself is interesting. The attitude that the authors had, you know, these were all people that were lived in the metropolitan area, um, you know, and their view of this part of the state was pretty dismissive. So this is what they wrote about the Ware River, um, the watershed of the Ware River, contains a very small population and the factories and mills upon it are small. So basically from their point of view, you know, it, it didn't really play much in the economy of Massachusetts if those towns and factories weren't uh, there anymore. Um, and then they really liked the Swift River and the Swift River Valley. Um, the way they described it was they said, um, the river is made up of three branches and the topography is remarkable. So this map is a map that is, um, has sort of two maps on it. It has the historic map of the towns. That's what the brown lines are. Um, it shows you the road, the road, uh, the route of the railway that ran through the Swift River Valley through Springfield up through the valley up to Athol. Um, and it shows you the ponds and the lakes. There's Greenwich uh, Lake and Nisa Ponds at Lake is up here. It also shows you the dark blue, shows you the course of the Swift River. So the Swift River, which still does flow into the reservoir at the north end, has three branches. So a, a west branch, a middle branch, and an east branch. Um, if you're curious, uh, the west branch I think is uh, gate 16 is where you can see it. Middle branch is up there at gate 30. Uh, it's actually 29, 29 would be better to see it. And then um, gate 40, you can actually see the east branch. So naturally they came together, you know, historically they came together in one channel down here and end what was Enfield at the time and became one river and flowed south out of the valley. Um, and actually, and still does, the Swift River enters the Chicopee River um, in three rivers in Palmer. Um, but the, on this map, the engineers proposed what the reservoir would look like. So they drew a line around the Swift, this light blue line is around the Swift River watershed and their proposal of what would happen if they built two structures down at the south end. Um, I should add that this map is actually from the 1922 proposed. So this is the legislate that went into the legislation that actually created um, the Quabbin Reservoir. Um, but it is basically a copy of the map from the 1895 report. And again, just pointing out their estimation, extremely accurate. So you gotta remember they didn't have computers. So pencils and their brains to make these calculations. 
Um, but but actually, so the, the, the shape of the valley is what the engineers, the topography. So with these, these three branches, um, you know, by damming the river, that that low lying area would flood and would create a great um, drinking water supply. Um, another myth, this myth, lucky number 13, is that um, I think when we talk about it, people think that everyone picked up and moved out all at once, kind of like almost like a refugee thing where everyone got on the road with their belongings on their back and walked out of town. But it actually was a very long process. Um, this is just a great picture that shows someone moving a house. This was pretty unusual, actually. People didn't usually move their houses with them. Um, but uh, it, it took about 11 years. So the Swift River Project, or what became known as the Quamah Reservoir, started in 1927. Um, and it wasn't, the clearing and the construction wasn't complete until 1939. People actually had to be gone out of the valley by 1938. So properties were purchased individually. People slowly left. Things, buildings were removed and torn down. Trees were cut. Um, and we're fortunate that we have a lot of oral history from former residents who were young adults or children at the time um, and basically describing how the towns were slowly dismantled around you um, until at the very end it was just a desolate valley. This picture is from very late in the process and that building actually was used by the engineers as a um, as their headquarters building it was called the Chandler Mansion. Um, another myth we have a lot is that they tore down, they burned, they destroyed all the houses. Um, one of the things about the, this project, which I think is really pretty interesting, is that the state actually, you know, trying to make things easy on themselves, um, they had contracts on, you know, on, on logging to remove trees. They also, once they purchased property from individual families or individual homeowners, they would actually turn around and sell that property to other people. Um, so for instance, this is a picture of um, a recreational spot in Greenwich called Camp Quabbin. So you can rent cabins there. Um, so they purchased the, the cabins and the land from the owners and then they sold them. And you can see the other picture shows you the cabins being taken apart. So remember most of this project took place during the, the depression. Um, and so, you know, getting materials inexpensively because the state really did sell everything very inexpensively. Really, their goal was just to get things out of the valley um, as easily as they could. Um, so it was it was a way for a lot of people to come. They would um, farmers would buy the materials to build new barns. Um, there were a couple of construction companies that actually sort of built their their company um, using these materials. There was one out in the Amherst Greenfield area um, known as the Yankee Construction Company. Um, and then there was a man who built, and I'm blanking on his name right now, but he um, bought a lot of houses and moved them to Vermont. Um, and his name will come to me probably in about five minutes. Um, and uh, we don't unfortunately have a lot of information about who bought the buildings and where they were moved, but we do have some information about certain buildings. Um, Wade, his name was Charles Wade. And actually he's the one that moved this building here um, up in the, uh, the uh, mansion here up in the corner. This was known as the, the Gillette Mansion over here, a very nice house. Um, and he bought that one and moved it to a new location. Um, a man named Joseph Skinner, who at the time was president of Mount Holyoke, he actually bought a lot of structures and moved them as well. Um, and so just this is a, where these, these four structures were originally. So uh, the Gillette House was in Enfield, there was a church in Prescott, a church from um, Enfield, and then a house in Prescott. And in my next slide, it shows you where these particular buildings were moved. Um, the Gillette Mansion actually ended up on Staten Island, so someone paid Charles Wade to move it to Staten Island, and that was their house. Um, it's actually now on the New York City Historic Register, which is neat. Um, Joseph Skinner moved buildings to the Mount Holyoke uh, campus and his uh, there's a museum called the Skinner Museum and those buildings actually came from Prescott and they house his collection of artifacts. The other church I showed you was a it was the, um, a church in Enfield. Um, it was actually purchased by the Palmer Grange and moved to Palmer. Um, a few years ago they actually the Grange ended up selling it to the Amherst Railway Model Railway Club. So it's on South Street. South Main Street in Palmer, um, and it's owned by the Amherst Railway Model Railway Club. Um, down here is um, 
it was known as the Atkinson Tavern. It was a, um, you know, an old building in Prescott. Joseph Skinner actually moved it to the Big E Fairgrounds um, to Storoughton Village, which is a uh, part of the Big E Fairgrounds and has some historic structures there. And they actually have a plaque saying where the building came from. A lot of the buildings though were taken um, and rebuilt. We have a lot, we have some um, sort of uh, hearsay of where some buildings have gone. We have written records of where some buildings have gone, unfortunately, even though a lot of the records were kept really well, that particular piece of it, we don't have a lot of information on, which is kind of a shame. Um, a lot of people I think don't quite um, understand how eminent domain works. I mean, eminent domain is something that goes back to Great Britain. Um, and you know, it, it means the government is taking your land from you um, for the in, the, in theory, it's for the good of everyone else. Um, and it's, it's been used a lot in the United States for projects like the Quabbin Reservoir. Um, however, you are paid for your property, your paid market rate. Now, again, you don't have any, you know, you can't really, well, unless you want to take them to court, you can't really argue it. And most of these people did not bother suing the state. Um, but they were paid market rate for their property um, if they were landowners and homeowners. Um, the amount that they got varied depending on the cost, you know, the, the, um, the, what their property was worth. Um, in some cases, they did get loss of business. So um, this particular building shows you a, it was a car dealership and a garage in Enfield owned by a man named Thomas Sanderson. Um, and they were really, there was a real whole process around this. They, the surveyors uh, went out um, and this is the field notes um, from those particular surveyors. And it, it shows you where the uh, Sanderson property was. And this is just a rough copy. Then they went back and everything was um, officially laid out on a real estate map. Um, so he sold his property in 1929 um, and he received $21,000 for his 5.9 acres of land, the buildings on the land, but also he received loss of business. Um, so, you know, they estimated how much his business would have made in the future. So he took that money, he moved to Ware, and he actually opened a car dealership in Ware. Um, in the case of farmers like this family from Prescott, their name was Wendemuth. It was actually a sister and two brothers. Um, and the, with a cousin, they owned two properties. Um, they were paid $15,000 for their not quite 100 acres of land and the buildings on the land. Um, and they sold it in 1933. Farmers did not get loss of business. So they didn't get, you know, the cost of the value of the work they put into the land. Um, but in the case of the Wendemus, they moved to North Brookfield and bought a farm there. And they lived in North Brookfield. And um, it's kind of neat, actually, their, their property in North Brookfield is actually a conservation land now um, managed by the East Quabbin Land Trust, which is a local land trust in this area. Um, and this is again, I mean, most of these myths to me are big ones because I hear them all the time. And some of them um, are a little more frustrating than others. And for me, one of the frustrating ones is the really the idea that when they built the reservoir, you know, they removed the bodies, the graves without any care or thought, and that they left lots of graves behind. So the one that a lot of people have heard of is the grave of Wendell Farnsworth. His tombstone was found in Dana by hikers. Um, I don't know the particulars about his particular grave other than it was a singular grave um, on, you know, in the middle of a pasture in a field. However, I do know, I can say, um, having seen all the records um, of the process, that it really was meticulous and very, very organized. Um, and I just used an example of this particular grave because I love this gravestone. Um, this woman's name was Sarah Cooley. Um, and she lived in Greenwich. Um, she died long before the reservoir was built and she had no family living in the area by the time the reservoir was built. So she was, you know, uh, identified as an unknown body and she was up here. Um, I don't know if you can see at the top, oops, at the top of the photograph, um, it says U-776 and that meant unknown body 776. So they did, you know, organize it and bodies that had no living representative were, were identified as unknown, even if, you know, from this case, they obviously knew who she was. Um, anyway, so we sort of travel the process of her grave. Um, one of the things they did do is they made really big efforts to find as many graves as they could. 
Um, this is a report that is in the unknown grave file. Um, they interviewed former residents of town. So Henry Lyman, who was an old resident. Um, they interviewed a man who was the cemetery commission. They interviewed another cemetery commission. They looked through the town records. They looked through the church records. So they tried to locate as many graves as they could. Um, they also, they also, when they identified a living representative, they would write letters. They would, you know, when we look through the files, we can see family trees that people sent back to them and said, yeah, that person is, you know, my fifth cousin, and this is who they're descended from. Um, so then they had this information, they went into the cemeteries and they mapped them. Um, and this is a map of the cemetery that Sarah Cooley was buried in. She was in lot 318, um, along with other members of her family. So here she is, 318, um, in block four, actually, although it says block six, but. Um, um, the next thing they would do then after they map them is that they would actually survey, um, they would investigate, they would um, uh, and survey where the graves were. They would list all of the gravestones and the condition of them. Um, you can see on this particular sheet here, they also say, you know, depression and marble headstone, depression indicates use. So they, they, maybe did not actually have a headstone, but they knew that there was, um, had been a grave there by the way, by the condition of the soil. And they would record all that as well. Oh, I'm sorry, there's a little detail of Sarah's. Um, so hers was, it's called Fieldstone, uh, what her grave is made of. They con considered it in poor condition. Um, and it, they wrote down her, the sub inscription in memory of Mrs. Sarah, Sarah, late consort of Mr. Reuben Cooley, who died June year of 1784 in the 29th year of her age. And they say how big the headstone was. Um, and so this is, they had daily reports. So the people whose job, it, the laborers whose job was to actually remove the grave um, on the, the first list actually is, it's basically like it was a checklist and they go through, okay, we, we, we removed um, Sarah Cooley the body the wife of Reuben, we, we have removed what was there or remained of her remains. And then they would issue a daily report to the engineer in charge. And she's marked as U776 Greenwich, lot 318, block four. And they removed four bodies from that lot along with hers. Um, and so Sarah was reburied um, in the Greenwich section of the cemetery because she had no living relative. Because there is another really persistent myth. If you've been to Qualvin Park Cemetery, it is not set up in the way that, um, you know, cemetery by cemetery. And so a lot of people are like, oh, the state didn't care. They just buried the bodies wherever they thought, you know, wherever they needed to. They filled it in back to front. That's actually not true. Actually, what it was is that if there were living representatives of the um, families, they actually would pick the lots where they wanted their families to be reburied. For instance, if my grandparents had been buried in Greenwich, and I was a representative um, then, and, and we had four lots and two of them were used. Um, I would get four lots and they would rebury my grandparents in the area that I chose. And then my, I would be deeded the rest of those lots. Um, and so that's why it's not really town by town or section by section. However, um, in the case of a grave like Sarah Cooley who had no living representative, she was buried together with other graves from Greenwich um, in the South part of the cemetery. Um, and I, I think Greenwich and Prescott is the south part and the north part has the unclaimed, un, unknown um, bodies from Dana and Enfield. So um, they designed the cemetery. Um, it, was, it was dedicated in 1932. Um, they did take stones from all of the cemeteries that they removed. So 34 cemeteries and the columns at the entrance of the Quam Park Cemetery are built from those stones. Um, and they list all the cemeteries that were removed. Um, and it was a really big project. Uh, so if you see, you know, like I list 7,613 graves were disinterred. Um, and of the, that number, almost all of them were reburied at Quabbin Park. So 6,601 were reburied at Quabbin Park. People could have the choice to have their family's bodies reburied at another location if that was their choice. So this is a good one. A lot of people love this story. And this is the story of the, the Dugmar golf course. 
And, you know, the myth is, oh, they speculated. They had inside knowledge of what was going to happen. Um, and I have to say, this is a myth that probably isn't a myth. <laughs> so um, they bought, so there were two men from uh, Springfield. They owned or were CEO of a company in Springfield, Thomas Mahar and John Duggan. Um, so they bought 147 acres of land in Greenwich for $6,750 in 1925. I mean, by 1925, this was a pretty serious conversation about taking this land and flooding it. So I'll, I'm not sure why you would do that. Um, but they did, they bought it and they developed a nine hole golf course and they built this nice golf club clubhouse. Um, apparently one of the things they did do there was, this was in the middle of prohibition, of course, is that they did actually, you know, have liquor and they and their friends would be there playing golf and, and drinking alcohol. Um, and then the state, you know, you know, took their land, um, and the, the process, the way the process were, worked is that the, the property owner would um, submit a property blank saying how much they thought their land was worth. So, worth. so um, Thomas Maher and John Duggan said the land that they had developed, the 147 acres that they had developed into a golf course was worth $360,000. Um, they actually did take the state to court, um, and after the lawsuit, um, they ended up with $179,041. How much they put into the development of the golf course and building that clubhouse, I don't know, but I think going from you know $67,000 to over $150,000, they did do pretty well on that land deal. Um, I've heard this a lot, which is always a little surprising to me, but it may be because I work right by the spillway. I see when it's active and we also pay a lot of attention to that because it's very exciting the day it spills over. Um, a lot of people think that this reservoir is never full, that it hasn't been full in, you know, decades. This is a great picture. This is from the worst years of the drought in 1966. If you've never seen how low the water actually was, this is the Quabbin Spillway. Um, but um, it actually um, has been full um, almost not quite half the number of years it's been in existence. So 1947 was the first year it was full. Um, so that's, it took about seven years for the reservoir to fill. Um, and I list all the years that it has been, that it reached capacity. And then this is a great chart um, that MWRA um, created that shows you. So the red line here is capacity. So it is measured by elevation above Boston Harbor low tide. So 530 feet above Boston Harbor low tide is when it's considered full. Um, and you can see for many years, it did pretty well in the beginning and then woo, really bad drought in New England in the 60s. Um, and I think it was 12 years. So from 1961 to 1976, actually it was at 15 years, it did not reach capacity. Um, and that's when there was a lot of concern about water supply in for the Boston area and what they were gonna do for the future. Um, and then it regained, and you can see over the years, you know, we've had some droughts in the 80s and the early 2000s. So this latest dip was 2016. We had a pretty serious drought in our region, um, but overall, Quammen actually did pretty well. It was above 80% most of the year. And then this last year, it does. This ends in May of of 2022, so it doesn't really show everything. But um, this year, we did have a drought in our region, and it was pretty serious. But um, Quammen actually um, managed the drought quite well, and we. Um, you know, we never actually went below 85% full. So anything above 80% full is considered active. And we actually did spill in the spring. We had the reservoir was active. The spillway was active this spring. And if you didn't get a chance to see it, it was pretty short. It was only a couple of weeks, but here's some photographs from the spring um, going over the, the spillway. Um, so there's actually kind of two pieces to the swill spillway. This one's called the lower spillway, and that'll that'll actually water will spill at 528 feet above Boston Harbor low tide. This big long wall is the main spillway, and that spills at 530 feet. Here's the channel going underneath the spillway bridge, and then here's the waterfall that it creates as the water goes into the Swift River south of the reservoir, south of the dam. Um, so myth number 20, it's not really a myth, but you know, we're only concerned with protecting the water quality. I mean, we're not only concerned, but that is our primary concern. Um, this is a vital resource in Massachusetts. Uh, this is the water supply for over 3 million people. So water quality is the number one concern, protecting the water. Um, and this is just 
a picture of Quabbin and then also Ware River. So Ware River is a is a is considered an active part of the water supply. It is it is part of the numbers that they use when they talk about the safe yield of the water supply um, for those 43 uh, percent of the state. Um, so you know we we watershed protection. That's how we protect the water. And if you are unfamiliar with what a watershed is, we all live in a watershed. It's the land that surrounds a body of water. And activity on that land impacts water quality. And if you're talking about a drinking water supply, um, you have to be very concerned about what happens on the land and in the, in the water. So we are concerned about the forest, um, how we manage the forest. We're concerned about the water quality. Um, we're concerned about the infrastructure that creates the reservoir, the dam. Um, we're concerned, and the thing probably most people think about the most is the wildlife, and recreational activities and which the two pictures here I have wildlife biologists and I have the rangers um, so you know in terms of recreational activity we do limit what people can do it's limited to low impact um, activities like hiking but you know you can hike most of the reservoir you can bike in a lot of areas a lot of the roads I should say not a, a lot of the areas of road biking only um, and we do allow fishing uh, during our fishing season on the northern part of the reservoir. Um, the Ware River watershed, because it is, um, you know, a little, it's a, a little bit, can be recreated, used a little bit more for recreation. Um, so um, dog walking is allowed there, um, more, a lot more areas to hike and, and fish and, and hunt in those areas as well. But the wildlife part of it and and also re sort of going along with rec um, recreation is people would love to walk their dogs at Quabbin. And uh, it's very confusing for a lot of people why they can't walk their dogs because they like to take their dogs for a walk in the woods. Um, and we don't prohibit them because of the wildlife. Um, you may be unaware um, that dog waste is full of all kinds of harmful bacteria. Be um, but oftentimes, you know, we talk to people why you can't, you know, you, you can't walk your dog. Well, you have wildlife living there and they're you know, leaving their fecal matter in the woods. Why aren't you concerned with them? And probably the biggest thing really is how many dogs there are. Um, so there's a, they estimate 83 million dogs in the US and that's probably an older estimation. And if I was in a room with all of you and I asked you to raise your hand, I would bet ha at least half of you and possibly two thirds of you would raise your hand and say, yeah, I have a dog. And some of you probably have more than one dog. So there's a lot of dogs in our society. Um, and so it's, it's a, the potential for Contamination from dog waste is really, really high, which is why we don't allow dog walking along the, the Quabbin, um, in the Quabbin Forest. But we are concerned about certain types of reservoir of wildlife, namely Canada geese and gulls, um, and the same reason, which is, you know, if you have too many of these, um, these particular birds hanging out on the water or nesting near the water, you have a potential for a lot of fecal contamination. Um, so we are concerned not only about, you know, domestic animals, but also about certain species of wildlife as well. Um, this is a myth that also a lot of people are interested in, um, that we have mountain lions living at Quabbin Reservoir, um, and we do not have them living there. There was cougar scat found at Quabbin in 1996, definitely identified as cougar, and there were cougar tracks found there in 2011, again, definitely identified as, as cougar. Um, so wildlife biologists are scientists and they have a criteria, um, you know, that they're gonna go through. So if you come with them with a picture, but we have, yeah, they have no other evidence to go on, you know, they're not gonna say definitely, oh yeah, that's, you know, we have cougars in Massachusetts. So there's a really great, actually art, great article on the Mass Wildlife website talking about um, mountain lions or cougars in Massachusetts. Um, and what they're saying right now is that there's no evidence of reproducing cougars living in Massachusetts. So the, the most recent 2011 was the one where that cougar actually traveled from South Dakota through New York, you know, through Massachusetts and then ended up getting killed in Connecticut. And they knew that because they could trace it back by scat and hair and um, all kinds of things and tracks. Um, so I, I think what they would say is that, you know, there is a possibility of individual uh, individuals wandering through Massachusetts, but no reproducing cougars. And if you're curious, here's a cougar track, how big they are, and then some cougar scat as well. 
However, Quabbin and Water Watershed have, uh, um, they support a diversity of wildlife, all sorts of wonderful animals. I know we all love um, spotting bears and turkey and moose and um, common loons, all kinds of birds, all kinds of reptiles, turtles, amphibians, and of course, bald eagles. Everybody loves bald eagles. However, and this is a joke, I can't confirm or deny Sasquatch. <laughs> so, um, this is interesting. Uh, this is very controversial. Um, and it is a myth that timber rattlesnakes were released on Mount Zion. Mount Zion is the largest island in Quabbin Reservoir. So uh, the program was proposed in 2016 um, by Mass Wildlife, and they chose Mount Zion as a location because it's not open to the public, but it has good habitat. And they hope that they create a protected colony of timber rattlesnakes. Um, they did not go forward with the program um, for a variety of reasons, um, primarily because um, they weren't able to help people get beyond their fear of rattlesnakes. Um, we do have rattlesnakes in Massachusetts. They are a native species of Massachusetts. And I, I think it's interesting because there's other animals that have re reintroduced to Massachusetts like bald eagles or wild turkeys um, and that are native. Um, but snakes hold a certain role in our, in our society, in our culture, and they, um, people are not as fond of them. Um, however, they do exist and they do have five localized um, communities in areas within the Commonwealth. Um, but it's important to note that they have sustained the largest decline of any native reptile in the last 150 years. It's also important to note that no one's died of a snake bite, a timber rattlesnake snake bite since the 1600s. So. And here's an animal that was reintroduced, um, which was very popular when they started this program, but they don't still bring eagle chicks to Quabbin. They did this program in the 1980s specifically to um, hope in the hopes that eagles would imprint on Massachusetts and come back and nest here. Um, so they did it between the years of 1986, or sorry, 1982 to 1988. They brought 41 eagles here, mainly from Nova Scotia, and it was hugely successful. Um, and at this point, there are now over 80 territorial pairs, bald eagle pairs in Massachusetts um, and in much of the state, including urban and suburban areas. I did a program for a school in Waltham um, in Jan uh, earlier this month, and the teacher told me that there's a bald eagle nest in a cemetery in Waltham, which I think is really awesome. It's also really cool over the course of my time at Quabbin, which has now been about, so been over 15 years and doing programs with kids and asking them if they've ever seen a bald eagle. Um, it's now gotten to the point where a majority of kids are raising their hand, um, where when I started, it generally wasn't. So I think that's a really amazing story. It's a wonderful story to remember um, about how we can help wildlife when we care hard enough. Um, and then last myth, myth number 25, um, that when the water is low, you can see the church steeples and other buildings. Um, just at the bottom, I want to note that this is not a photo of Guavin. This is a photo from a reservoir in Derbyshire, England called Derwent Reservoir. And I think that might be where the myth comes from. Um, when they built the Quabbin Reservoir, they cleared everything out of the area that they estimated would flood. So even 10 feet above where they thought it would flood. Um, all the buildings, um, most of the vegetation, they actually set controlled fires to burn vegetation. And this is a picture that was taken right towards the very end. There's Enfield Town Hall. It's surrounded by nothing because everything else has been taken. Um, and they did that to create a very clean source of water because it was going to be drinking water. So what they left behind was what you see when you hike in the woods, if you're looking for what was there before. You see the roads, you see foundations of buildings, and you see the stone walls that the farmers built. Um, the trees, the majority of the trees that are in our forest were planted after the reservoir was built. And just some numbers. Um, when we include the Ware River watershed, that 23,000 acres and those 300 people that were displaced, we, there were about 2,800 people displaced. 1,400 buildings removed, um, 34 cemeteries, 7,613 known graves, um, and 103,443 acres of land were purchased to build these, uh, to create these two areas. So specifically with the Quabbin, they really transformed this valley. Picture of Enfield from 1920s. This next picture shows you the valley after everything was cleared out. 
uh, you can just see a lone vehicle driving. And then the view that we see today when we visit Quabbin, which is this beautiful, what appears to be this beautiful natural area. Um, we got to remember though, that those islands were hills in a valley. So just some things, um, a thank you to the Swift River Historical Society, the Rutland Historical Society, the Barry Historical Society and Mouse Wildlife for their use of their photos. Um, a lot of the DCR photos I use came from our archives and thanks to our archivist and the MWRA archivist. Many of those photos are now housed um, on the Digital Commonwealth, which is this really awesome website managed by the Boston Public Library with all sorts of incredible historic views. Um, and they're in the process of uploading the construction photos for Quabbin Reservoir. Um, our archivist did a whole presentation about it. If you're interested, I did include the link there. Um, or you could just go on to the Quabbin, DCR Quabbin website and, and search for it that way. Um, if you're really interested in how more deeply and how we manage the lands, again, visit our website. We have a lot of information about all kinds of things, forestry, and, um, environmental quality, lots of interesting things in there. Um, I talked a little bit about wildlife. Um, I live in Central Mass, and so there's a lot of wildlife now living around us. A lot of them are returnees to Massachusetts. Um, if you're curious about their habits and how we can coexist with them, Mass Wildlife has tons of information. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the program, we have a lot of upcoming programs, remote, mainly remote, um, and you can find out more of those um, at the Quabbin events page, or you can email us, or you can come visit us at the Visitor Center, um, and we're open every day but Wednesday, 8.30 to 4.30. So uh, thanks so much for taking the time um, to join me in this presentation. As you can tell, I do like talking a lot about co-op. Um, so um, I'm going to see if I can um, answer these questions. I'm actually, um, Justin, if you can help me out here. I don't know. Did you get all the, did you get a lot of messages? Um, just a couple coming in right now. Um, take the first one. How long did it take for Quabbin to fill? So um, the construction was done in 1939 and the reservoir was full in 1946. So seven years, the valley flooded, took, took the flood. Um, another one coming in. Um, so they said, I watched an excellent documentary on the Quabbin, which seemed at least 10 years old. I found it on YouTube. It followed state police divers and researchers from UMass. It was noted that there were not much life, fish, plants in the reservoir. Is that still true? Is the reservoir naturalizing over time? So the, I, I don't, I'm not really sure when they say not much life, I'll be honest, I'm not, you know, I'm not a hydrologist or a scientist. Um, we do have plenty of fish. It's a very popular fish, a fishery. Um, we also have a lot of, um, you know, healthy plant life and, you know, a, a aquatic, um, microscopic aquatic life, um, but it is, it was designed to be very clear um, because it is a drinking water supply. Um, Justin, if you can get that person's name and um, get an email from them and I'll get a little bit more detail on that. So it's, it's not like it's a dead body of water. It's designed to stay, because it is an unfiltered drinking water supply. It's, it was built and designed to stay um, with a higher level of clarity than say another type of body of water. So I do see one question, why are bicycles limited to paved roads? Some of the paved roads are deteriorating and I wonder whether there will be no bicycles allowed. Um, no, I don't think that's gonna happen. Um, a lot of the times our limitation on activities has a lot to do with, um, so the fewer people you have, you know, it's, it's basically trying to create a balance of not having too much activity, but allowing enough activity so, um, you know, we can allow some recreation um, and they chose roads that were considered, um, you know, in decent shape and good, good to bicycle. And there's no changes to that as far as I know. So uh, there was a question. Um, they were wondering if Quabbin fills other lakes. Um, they heard, uh, it was my understanding that Beaver Lake is man-made and fed by Quabbin. Uh, is that correct or not? Um, so Beaver Lake might be man-made. Um, it is not filled by Quabbin. So. And then how did Quabbin fill mostly? Diversion so, of rivers or, or both with rain? So they dam the Swift River. So the Windsor Dam, 
and a second structure called the Goodnow Dyke, in, where they call it impounding. They impounded the Swift River and that caused the valley to flood. So that is how the reservoir was created. Another question about the, was the construction, um, was the topsoil removed before it was filled? In a lot of places, yeah, they did actually remove the topsoil as well. Oh, someone's saying they have an ancestor that's buried um, in the new cemetery, and they're just wondering if and how they can find uh, the gravestone. Um, we actually have on our website again, um, over in during COVID, um, our GIS staff did all sorts of tremendous, awesome stuff to make the records we have available more readily available. I mean, they were always available to the public, but you had to come to the visitor center. Um, so if you just Google Quabbin, Park Cemetery, DCR Quam Park Cemetery, and it'll come to the, the cemetery grave lots search, and you can type in the name of your relative um, and find them and find that there's a map that'll help you locate where they're buried. If you have any trouble, you know, feel free to email us, quamandvisitor.center at mass.gov, and we're more than happy to help you. Um, someone asked if you visit Quabbin and you notice someone flying a drone or disturbing wildlife, what's the best thing to do? Um, the best thing to do is to notify our rangers. Um, they can't usually um, respond right away, but if you take note of where it happened, um, if you give me a second, I'll give you the ranger phone number. Um, and we appreciate help from visitors, keeping an eye out. Um, so best number to call for the watershed rangers is 617 8282452 another question about uh, why is the peninsula off limits so in 1984 there was additional legislation created that watershed protection act um, and they set aside the prescott peninsula as a wildlife refuge so it is managed more for wildlife there's actually a lot of research that's done there on both not just wildlife but soils and plants um, and so that's why it's set aside i have uh, a question i can see that someone asked if we control beavers otters and muskrats we do control beavers and muskrats in what's considered the aquatic pathogen zone which is um, parts of the southern part of the reservoir so they will remove beavers and muskrats if they have to Basically, they destroy their lodge and encourage them to go build a new one somewhere else. Here's another one coming in. Is there an archive of photos of specific buildings? Uh, we were told a room in our house had been a one room schoolhouse at the Quab Inn and would love to see it in its an original form. So when you come to, so we do there, so that digital Commonwealth that I mentioned. So first of all, yes, that we have in our building, in our archive, we have the historic photographs. They have been scanned and the real estate photographs are on the digital Commonwealth. Unfortunately, if you do not know the owner of the building, it would be very difficult for you to find it. Um, and that's that sort of um, missing link. So when people bought um, buildings, like let's say for instance, people that owned your house bought you know, material and built a new a wing on their house. We don't know who they were. Um, so we can't help you at that end. But I mean, certainly if you want to scroll through the photographs, if you have an idea of what town it came from, that can certainly help you. Um, and again, you know, give us an email, give email quabinvisitor.center at mass.gov. And we, we might be able to give you a little bit of guidance. Um, um, a question about the Swift River. Uh, they're asking um, downstream of the dam, does it only have water if the spillway is spilling? So no, um, when they built the reservoir, because the plan was to impound the Swift River, which is part of the Connecticut River watershed, um, the Connecticut, state of Connecticut sued Massachusetts and said, you can't take that water permanently away from the Connecticut River watershed because that's shared water rights. So the design of the, the reservoir included um, releasing water into the Swift River. So every day um, we're required to release at least 20 million gallons a day into the Swift River below the dam. And so it's just, you know, passively goes through a, I don't know, it's not a tunnel, but it's just released by gravity into the Swift River. 
Um, when the spillway is active, there is more river, that more water. That's when it goes into the, it gets released into the Swift River. But the, the Swift River exists south of the dam because we are required to release water into it. Um, we got a great job, Maria, from someone. Um, I got a couple. I got one question here about native. If do Native American communities have foraging rights at the Quaman? I don't know specifically about Native American communities. Um, we do allow foraging of certain things like mushrooms and blueberries and apples, um, but I, I don't think it's specific to Native American communities. Um, someone asking about uh, if the Quaman Tower has been reopened yet. So unfortunately, to. right now the Quabbin Tower is not reopened. It uh, wouldn't be open in the winter anyway. Um, they have done a, or the engineers have um, done or completed the structural survey, and so they're um, at this point um, they know what needs to be done to uh, reopen it. Um, and there's several different sort of stages that could be done. Um, and basically, right now the question comes down as it always does to money. Um, so hopefully we will see it open within maybe the next year. I don't know though. It's it's an it was built in 1941, so it is an older structure. So um, someone asked, will there be a way to see the Zoom from the beginning? Um, we did record it, and it will be on our website. There'll be a link um, on the DCR Watershed website. I I don't know when. With hopefully within the next couple of weeks though. Um, someone asked why we don't allow cross country skiing. Um, it again, a lot of our activity that it has a, to do with the amount of people that do it or are interested in doing it. Um, so cross country skiing is popular, um, and so they decided when they wrote the first access plan in the '80s that they're not going to allow it. So they do update the access plan every ten years. Um, the next Quabbin access plan will be is slated for 2028. So. We'll see what happens then. Um, I shared the ag the website back at the beginning of the chat. Let me see if I can find it again. Um, I mean, you can always just Google DCR Quabbin Reservoir, and that'll get you there. But I'm putting the chat address in the, uh, the sorry the website address in the chat again for everyone anyone. I did see a question about Bill Gass, and yes, Bill Gass was the man that owned the Yankee Construction Company in Amherst and Greenfield. So, um, someone, I see a question. There's their screens to stop debris from entering the piping system. So the aqu aqueducts have screens, and all along the way, um, at certain points, there must be screens. But I know the aqueduct from Quabbin does so it'd keep fish out. Are there any plans to trim trees to open up the viewing areas? Um, do not know, but yeah, it'd be nice to have the vistas open. Can I talk about who did the logging and the issues around that? I, I don't know specifically what logging you're talking about actually, or what issues, but our next uh, presentation is actually about watershed forestry. Our chief forester is actually gonna do a presentation about it. Um, and if that is something that is concerns you or interests you, it should be a great presentation. Oh, oh, the woodpeckers. Um, so the question was, when the Quabbin was built, the loggers came from Boston. So they weren't loggers per se. Um, so the work on the Quabbin, the construction and everything was actually the state contracted with private companies to do all of the construction work. There was one group of individuals um, and it was, it, they were about 3000 of them over the, a couple of summers. So 1935, 36 and 37. And it was a program kind of similar to the WPA or um, so the Works Progress Administration, that was a federal program which hired unemployed men to do all kinds, and women actually, all kinds of amazing things. Um, but this program was a state one and it was set up for unemployed young men. Um, there is some um, evidence that a lot of these young, employed, young unemployed men came from the Boston area and were sent out here you know, for the job and a lot of them did not have the experience that they needed to clear trees and vegetation and the locals called them the woodpeckers so they also because they were mostly young men um and you know 
all of them together, they did apparently have, there was a lot of carousing and bad behavior. So, so the locals weren't too fond of them. Let's put it that way. All right, did we get all the questions? I think we did. Yeah, we did on my end, yep. All right, well, thanks so much everyone for coming and um, check out our other presentations. And like I said, if you have people who are interested in it, we will eventually, hopefully within the month, get this on the, on the website.